I don't think I could afford anything in there except a napkin. <laughs> My channel. Will you join me on another Uber boat going along the Thames in central London? I did this yesterday going down uh, towards London Bridge and I had a great day out visiting um, the Clink Prison and uh, Borough Market. So like yesterday I've got no plan for today at all, only this time I'm going to cross over London Bridge to the north side of the Thames and uh, see what I can discover up there, find a museum or um, a gallery or something of interest, something exciting to do. Went back to that cafe this morning, had a bacon roll. I quite like a bacon roll, had a cup of tea as well, I quite like a cup of tea. Had a custard tart, I do like custard tarts. If they hadn't already been invented, I'd have to invent them, they're so delicious. I might try and find, um, might head up towards Covent Garden. It's giving me a good idea actually. I might go up towards Covent Garden and see if I can find um, uh, some cake stands and cake, um, cake shops up there. It's quite a few. Well, there used to be when I was in London a couple of years ago. So I might try and um, eat my way around Covent Garden. But anyway, I'm going to start down at um, Southwark Cathedral where um, I bypassed yesterday between the Clink and um, Borough Market. So I'm going to start there and head over the River Thames, across London Bridge, and then see where I go from there. So let's go and have some fun in London and on day two of my summer holiday. Had a walk around the inside of uh, Southwark Cathedral. I just sat quietly in there, just taking up the atmosphere and marvelling at the interior uh, decor. Really is um, quite magnificent. It was built between 1220 and 1420 as a, an Augustinian priory. It was known as uh, Southwark Priory. Of course, it's now known as uh, Southwark Cathedral. But it must have been absolutely very grand when it was when it was built. But all the uh, the modern architecture around it rather sort of swamps the building. It's not as open as uh, somewhere like Westminster Abbey, for example. It's, uh, it's quite a shame that it's sort of, sort of buried in a way. But the uh, the church has a or well, cathedral has a famous connection because John Harvard was ba baptized there on the 29th November, 1607. And he went on to found Harvard University in Massachusetts in the United States of America. Another interesting connection with London and the United States. The site of London Bridge uh, represents the oldest crossing point in London. The Romans built the first bridge here around about AD 50. But it wasn't until the late 1700s that other bridges were built across the Thames in other parts of London. The current bridge here was built in 1972. The previous bridge, which had stood here since 1831, uh, was built by uh, John Rene. That was taken down in 1968, piece by piece, and sold to the American Robert McCulloch, who uh, re-erected it across Lake Havasu in the state of Arizona, or the city of Arizona. Um, but back in the early days, London Bridge had a bit of a reputation because the old London bridges kept falling down. The first bridge was built here in Norman times. That blew down in high winds. 
in the year 1091. It was rebuilt in the reign of um, William II, but that burnt down in, in 1136. So the old London bridges had a reputation for falling down. And that brings me neatly into a little song, London Bridges Falling Down. But don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. But that's where the origins of the song came from. The unreliable bridges that kept falling down. And that was London Bridge. And, uh, but this one is quite sturdy. It's been here, say, quite a long time, since 1972. And I don't think it's gonna fall down anytime soon. At least I hope not. <laughs> But now let's head towards the, uh, the northern side of the, uh, the River Thames. We head down towards the monument, which commemorates the Great Fire of London. The, uh, the monument which commemorates the Great Fire of London of September 1666. It's quite a magnificent building, or structure, I should say, quite a magnificent uh, monument. Uh, it's 202 feet tall and there are 311 steps inside. And I just wonder if it's open because uh, like most things in London they seem to be closed at the moment. A lot of the businesses around here seem to be closed, all the shutters are up. So let's have a look. Yeah. Quite a shame if it is. Yes, it's closed. Guess due to the, uh, the COVID reg regulations. Yep, there we go, it's closed. There we go. Uh, it was built between 1671 and 1677. It was designed by Robert Hooke and uh, Sir Christopher Wren as well. Uh, it's actually built on the um, on the site of the former St Margaret's Church, um, which is actually the first building to be st which was destroyed by the uh, the Great Fire. And it said if you uh, lay the monument on its side, it would reach the uh, the shop on Pudding Lane, where the fire started. And just ahead of me is Pudding Lane. Uh, the fire started on the. Uh, the evening of the 2nd of September 1666 inside the baker shop belonging to Thomas Farriner who was the king's baker and his shop was just on the corner with uh, St George's Lane or very near to the corner of St George's Lane which is where I'm just about to uh, come to now. Uh, after the fire um, Farriner rebuilt his shop and he died in uh, 1670 but yeah, this is the this is where it all happened. But back then, of course, all the buildings were um, were wooden buildings, very narrow streets. So as the um, the dry timbers caught a light, the sp the fire spread very rapidly. And with uh, non-existent firefighting equipment, apart from perhaps a bucket of water, it's no surprise that the uh, the fire spread. But uh, it's a shame that uh, I couldn't have got up the monument. And, uh, and had a look from out there. But I did go up a few years ago, so uh, here are a few pictures which I took a few years ago. underground down to the embankment. I thought I'd save my legs and head up down towards the Covent Garden area and uh, try and find something for lunch. 
My, uh, my sandwich this morning was for breakfast. Just wasn't as uh, substantial as the um, as the breakfast roll I had yesterday. But uh, we'll find something up here for a nice cup of tea, a slice of cake, and something nice for lunch as we explore the area up towards uh, Covent Garden. There's a lot of people around today. Probably more so here than uh, over by the monument area. I guess there's more shops here, more businesses, and probably more, more of everything, which brings people to this part of London rather than the, uh, the city side where most of the uh, offices and, and uh, shops were, were empty. So uh, let's, have a, let's have a look and see. Walking down John Adams Street, and there's quite an interesting uh, blue plaque on the left-hand side here. Thomas Rowlandson, 1757 to 1827. He was a cartoonist, an artist. He did uh, political satires in his illustrations back in his day. I do like finding blue plaques. You learn so much from researching people if there's somebody you, you haven't already come across before. I've seen quite a few of his, uh, his drawings in galleries and things and in reprints and they were quite edgy for the day, for his time. So it's quite interesting to, uh, to see that. Just up ahead is uh, Adam Street, and there's another blue plaque to uh, Sir Richard Arkwright, who was a late 18th century uh, industrialist and inventor. He invented machines for improving uh, textile production. Uh, but uh, number 10 on Adam Street, the front door is very similar to that of uh, number 10 Downing Street. And uh, it's been used in quite a few films Quite a few, quite a few doors are, are, are very similar in London. Manufactured at the same sort of time, much the same sort of period, so designs were were reused. And if you see the door in a film, you can check whether it's actually Number 10 Downing Street or not, or Adam Street, because Number 10 Downing Street doesn't have a front door key. Uh, it's let in by people are let in by security, but on uh, Number 10 Adam Street, there is um. There is a front door key, so that's how you can tell the two to a part if you see them in films. But up ahead here is the Strand Palace Hotel, and opposite that is the Savoy, one of London's poshest hotels. It's really rather splendid in there. I'm not going to go in. I don't think I could afford anything in there except a napkin. <laughs> I don't think my budget would stretch to um, afternoon tea at the Savoy. But if you would like to sponsor afternoon tea at the Savoy, then you can go on to the uh, Buy Me A Coffee link, which you'll find in the description below, and purchase several hundred coffees for me. And I might just be able to afford afternoon tea at, uh, at the Savoy Hotel. But uh, one coffee would be enough. I'll get something there in Starbucks or something. But <laughs> any, any generosity would be nice. Someone to buy me a coffee because it does get rather um, thirsty work out filming and uh, talking. So any coffees bought is very much greatly appreciated. Thank you. What is interesting about the Savoy Hotel is the road that leads from the Strand up to the front of the hotel because it's the only street in England that they drive on the right. Back in the olden days, the old Hanson cabs would draw up outside the theatre at the bottom, and the passengers would, un un would uh, alight on the right-hand side. So that's the reason why that street is different to all the others. Every street in England drives on the left, except the one at the Savoy, which drives on the right. Quite strange, really. But, uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, little anomalies of London. But now let's head up towards uh, Covent Garden and see what we can discover up there. 
It's absolutely bristling with people here. Everybody eating out in the cafes, and the shops are busy. There's so much more happening here compared to uh, over by the monument to the Great Fire of London. That part of London's almost abandoned. But all the shops here, they, uh, yeah, they're all open. There's loads of people here, it's just brilliant. Just past the uh, London Transport Museum. It's been an old flower market there. It's been a market in, um, in this part of London since I think 1654. But they, uh, they turned the old flower market there into a, the London Transport Museum. Got old vehicles going back over a hundred years. Tells the story of transport in London. Absolutely brilliant in there. Went in there a few years ago. So uh, here are a few photographs from a few years ago. got a cup of tea. I decided to escape from the, uh, the hustle and the bustle, which was uh, Covent Garden. So many people there and the restaurants were crowded, the cafes were crowded. Uh, and the pop music was blaring out through the, uh, the loudspeakers. Every, every cafe had its own pop music. A bit too much really. So I've come down to the Embankment Gardens. Got myself a cup of tea, got a sandwich. Mm. Lovely. It's rather nice down here. Nice little fountain next to me. Mm. Should have come down here straight, really, from coming off the underground, but I thought I'd give Covent Garden a go. I do like walking around Covent Garden. You do, you do see some interesting people and meet some interesting people as well. It's really good fun. But today just hasn't gone according to plan because the places I want to go to were closed, partly due to uh, COVID. Madness, really. Come on holiday for a few days in London and everywhere you want to go to, is, uh, it's, been, it's been closed which is a real shame. So, um, because there are places I'd like to have gone and shown you and uh, I haven't been able to. So I'm really sorry about that. But uh, that's life, I suppose. And that's the situation we find ourselves in at the moment. But there's always another day, another location and um, another opportunities to have some fun. So thank you so much for watching this little video. And uh, I look forward to seeing you somewhere else for another adventure some other time. Thanks for watching.